first uh, speaker is Natalie Haynes. Um, Natalie uh, began her performing career as a member of the Footlights at Cambridge University, uh, where she read classics, and as well as having five sellout Edinburgh fringe runs. Um, she also had a number of uh, sellout national tours and has played virtually every comedy festival in the UK, as well as touring internationally. We've been talking about her uh, radio appearances, which have included Women's Hour, uh, Woman's Hour, A Good Read, What's the Point Of, and she's also been a panellist on Banter, Personality Test, We've Been Here Before, and Quote Unquote. Uh, she's review reviewed the arts for Front Row and Saturday Review, and has also appeared on television on Newsnight Review, More Force The Last Word, and BBC Force The Book Quiz. Uh, she has a children's novel called The Great Escape, which won a Pet Proggy Award for Best Animal Friendly Children's Book. And uh, she's going to be talking about uh, see, ancient wisdom, and her long standing interest in the classics is reflected in her latest book, The Ancient Guide to Modern Life, uh, which is excellent. We, we all bought a copy, um, which gave a talk at Conway Hall a, a couple of months ago. Um, and it's all about how the modern world is more interesting when it's refracted through the prism of the ancient one. Uh, so without further ado, uh, Miss Natalie Haynes. Hello! Uh, hello, hello. Now, if I stand to one side of that, that won't be as annoying for you, and also I'll still be able to see at the end of it. I would like it to go on record before we go any further, that I had a horrible time on Quote Unquote, because Nigel Reese is a prick, and I'm sorry to start a Sunday morning with that, but he is. He's a man who spent his entire career hanging around in toilets, noting down graffiti, and not, I'm sure, doing anything less toward than that, um, and then is incredibly condescending. And here is an example. I'm sorry, I will start the talk in a second, honestly. But actually, I'm going to let you choose, but then we'll get to that in a minute. So, I did Quote Unquote, and you do two recordings. I, as you can tell, I'm I'm still quite cross about this. And it was literally about five years ago. Um, but you do two recordings, and I was on with, I swear to God this is true, Brian Sewell, a woman who writes like a pet agony column for The Telegraph, and Ruth Padell, poet and classicist, who I like very much. And um, there is a round on, I can't remember, I wasn't paying attention, I'm not going to lie to you. And it's not my question, and it isn't even my team's question, and on my team is Brian Sewell, a man who I'm not necessarily destined to get on with, let's assume. And the question for the other team, which is Ruth, and some woman who writes a pet agony column, um, is about, uh, oh, um, the, <laughs> the quote, they have to identify, I swear to God this is true. The quote is, a long time ago, in a galaxy far, far away. And they go, Ooh, I don't know. Um, could it be, um, ooh, is it, uh, um, ooh. And eventually Brian Sewell chips in, is it from that thing which used to be on the radio, a, a hitchhiker or something? <laughs> I swear to God this is true, the recordings must still exist. And I'm trying really hard to be nice, because occasionally I do. And it cuts back, and, he, and Nigel was going, no, no, Brian, we're miles away. Cuts back to them. Oh, is it? And eventually, one of them, I swear to God, goes, hmm, is it Le Petit Prince? <laughs> <laughs> Whereupon I hurl down my pen with the words, for crying out loud, it's Star Wars! <laughs> and the whole of the room that we're recording in cheers. And Nigel Reese, I swear to God, goes, oh, Natalie, it's not their fault they're a bit too educated to have seen Star Wars. <laughs> I know. So I go, which one of my degrees from Cambridge would you like me to give back, Nigel? <laughs> to reduce my general education. And then, I wish this weren't true, but it is. The, the second program we were doing was um, the, the second round of it was like quotes from the classical world. And I read all of mine in Latin or Greek and made him ask for a translation out of sheer spite. <laughs> <laughs> They have never asked me back. <laughs> I am still not sorry. Um, so it's entirely up to you. Um, a couple of months I did the Voltaire lecture at Conway Hall, which I had a lovely time at, and these extremely nice people from the Pod Delusion um, recorded it and broadcast it. So I'm guessing that some of you may have heard it. Um, you may not necessarily want to hear it again. You can have it if you want, or essentially, I, I will go over there and read it. It's 26 pages. I've written it now. It's 9,500 words. I don't mind doing it again. Um, or we can keep it like this, and I'll just talk to you about the ancient world in a more kind of informal context. I'm entirely prepared to take a vote on this. Informal? Formal. 
Informal. All right then. So, The Ancient Guide to Modern Life, which is uh, the book that I uh, had published last year. And, ooh, that was alarming. Oh, no, it's behind the doors. Every now and then, you think maybe something will come in from the roof um, and, and land upon me and it will be alarming. But only for me, obviously not for you. For you, it would be entertaining. Um, briefly, I like to think. And then after that, terrible, and you'd be very upset. No. Okay, so... Um, the Ancient Guide to Modern Life is all about how, uh, essentially, the modern world makes more sense if you refract it through the prism of the ancient one. That generally, the ancients knew quite a lot of things. And while that doesn't mean you can go, oh, aren't the ancients marvellous? Let's walk, you know, glassy-eyed through the entire thing and forget about the torture and the slavery and all those things. Nonetheless, they knew loads of stuff and not knowing it, I would say, do say, holds us back. So, I am prepared to talk to you on any of the chapters. Uh, we've got till, I think, about 5 to 11, but you might want to do questions, so we'll have to see how you feel later on. Um, so, you can have, uh, and you need to pay attention to this, uh, politics, the law, philosophy, religion, women, uh, how we live, the town, the country, uh, show business and money. I am prepared to do, I don't know how long we've got, but probably about four of those. So really you just have to pick. Any choices? Women. women. Wow, excellent choice and so sternly said by a man who looks a bit like my dad. Hooray! <laughs> it's like I haven't abandoned him on Father's Day. I've now made you my honorary dad, so don't turn on me. And don't have an affair. Because that's what went wrong with my original dad. No one's, oh God, you are filming this. <laughs> <laughs> Ideally, don't. Um, <laughs> so, women, what do you want? Okay, we'll come to you second. Good, excellent, and well done. So, in fact, oh, do you know what we could totally do? Is a story that combines the two. Ah, oh, I'm on fire this morning, and it's so early. So, um, I think probably the most brilliant women in the ancient world are fictional. Um, it is necessarily true because we don't get to meet very many real women in the ancient world. Uh, for the excellent reason there are very few female writers. The most famous, of course, is Sappho, uh, who wrote the poem which begins, The man who sits opposite you seems to me to be like a god. Um, and we don't know if she was a lesbian. Uh, we don't know if she had a daughter. We don't know if she jumped into the sea for the love of a boatman or any of the stories about Sappho. We don't know. What she was was one of the most brilliant lyric poets of any age. Um, and we're very lucky that at least tiny scraps of her work survive. But there are very, very few women from the ancient world whose lives, in their own words, exist for us. Interestingly, though, um, the uh, very earliest example of women's hand handwriting in the world ever um, is, uh, was found at Hadrian's Wall, um, where um, a letter's been written from a woman to her sister. She's the wife of a commander there, a fort commander, um, and the letter has been written by a scribe. So interestingly, we'll get into literacy later, uh, otherwise we really will never get anywhere. Oh, but it's interesting, they're too late. So, interestingly, women can read and write, interesting, um, but you don't because you can afford a scribe. So that's a sign of, literacy isn't necessarily a sign of being well-to-do, as you might assume. It's a sign of being, uh, to a certain level, well-to-do. You your parents could afford to educate you, but then at a certain stage, you might simply have somebody else to do your writing for you. And this letter is written by a scribe to this woman's sister asking her to come for dinner. And then she adds a handwritten postscript, which says, I paraphrase slightly, um, please come, dearest heart, it just won't be the same without you. And that's the earliest example of women's handwriting that we have anywhere in the world. How amazing. Now I know. So, um, we have some very good villainous women lurking around in ancient Rome, of course, uh, made internationally famous by Robert Graves in I, Claudius, um, but he was a translator of Suetonius, uh, first and foremost. Suetonius is by far and away the best gossip of any era. He, uh, he lived out of time. If he had lived now, he would have been the most brilliant tabloid journalist ever because he has an amazing writing style and if anyone had ever even considered having any kind of deviant sex he absolutely knew with, with an unerring skill uh, so he would have been he frankly he was in a, in a non-twitter era he was wasted um <laughs> sad to say but he gives us lots of good villains in the ancient world. He gives us Livia, did she poison Augustus to get her son Tiberius to the throne? He gives us Agrippina, uh, the mother of Nero, uh, who famously murdered Claudius um, and then got murdered in turn by her son, by Nero, uh, who tried to kill her with a collapsing boat. Do you know this story? Uh, because nothing causes accidents like the sea, <laughs> says Anicetus, his head of boats. Um, and so she goes to sea, or to a lake, I think, um, and, uh, and the boat collapses, and she's with an old, her sort of freedwoman, Acheronia. Uh, and Acheronia, entirely failing to read the situation, when people come over to rescue them, she goes, save me, I'm the emperor's mother, and they beat her to death with oars. And Agrippina very wisely keeps quiet and gets to the shore, uh, but then she, uh, soldiers are sent to kill her. And when they get to her, she bears her womb and says, strike here. 
because what she means is my son is the person who's killing me and this is where he came from. Pretty cool, I think you have to agree. But, well, I'm not saying nice, I'm just saying kind of awesome, a little bit. Um, and if, while we're on the subject, though, of uh, women dying in extraordinary and heroic ways, uh, I should, we should go no further without mention of Aria Piter. Uh, Aria Piter's story comes to us through the letters of the younger Pliny. Uh, the younger Pliny, uh, sidebar, is uh, perhaps the only person who, uh, who didn't die uh, when Vesuvius erupted because he was too busy reading Livy. And his uncle, Pliny the Elder, no, I know, runs in the family, said, oh, I'm off to go and have a closer look at that volcano that's erupting over there. Do you fancy a trip? And he went, no, no, I'm busy reading Livy. <laughs> and therefore did not die, unlike Pliny the Elder, who did die. So just to prove that history saves lives, or at very least saves a life, um, <laughs> just so you know. Um, and he tells the story of Aria Piter um, because he wants to um, describe a particularly virtuous woman. All the women, actually, in Pliny are virtuous. He is not like Suetonius, not like Tacitus. Um, so he's always talking about his wife, Calpurnia, who was, I think, 15 when they married, and he was in his mid-40s. Mm. <laughs> and she was his third wife, and he says, oh, she's so devoted to him. She's always got my, my letters about her person and my writing. You go, oh, poor girl. <laughs> Your writing's really boring, Pliny the Younger. Most of it is about drains. <laughs> really hope she's got some smutty love notes from the gardener in between your letters because that would perk things right up she's only 15 come on give us some fun so uh, he relays the story of aria piter aria piter uh, was married to a man named Pytus, who was uh, ordered to commit suicide this happens all the time obviously in ancient rome and people tend to assume that they just had a sort of you know slightly suicidal bent of course it is not so um when you are prosecuted for treachery uh, or um uh, treason in the ancient world um, it was certainly in ancient Rome, then your property, if you are found guilty, is taken away and it's divided up among your uh, accusers. So the only thing to do is not to survive as long as it will take for the um, judgment to come in and commit suicide, and then your family can retain the property and they don't both lose their you know, father, husband, and get turned out in the street. And so uh, Pytus has to take his own life. He has been ordered so to do, and he can't do it. He picks up the knife uh, and he can't drive it into him. And Aria Piter is one of the most extraordinary stories in the ancient world, I think. Aria Piter takes the knife from him and she drives it into her breast and she says, see Pytus, it does not hurt. Awesome, huh? How awesome is that? Awesome is how awesome. But you see, even the heroic women don't die of old age in ancient Rome. <laughs> they get culled, I'm afraid, young, uh, one way or another. But the best story to tie politics and women together, I think, is Aristophanes' play, uh, The Lysistrata, um, which is Awesome. Um, and uh, I, with, this is a question that comes up over and over again, is why don't people perform ancient comedy the way they do ancient tragedy? Um, you are much more likely to see an Oedipus um, playing at the National than you are to see the birds, for example. And there's a very good reason for it, of course. It's a reference issue. Aristophanes is full of political jokes, and if you don't know who Cleon is, then you're not going to go, oh, brilliant, I love it when he calls him a tanner, this is awesome. And so it's, it's not so good. But it still seems to me they've just done an extremely good revival of uh, uh, Servant of Two Masters at the National, which I very much recommend if you haven't had a chance to see it. It's going on tour in the autumn. Um, and if they can move that to Sixties Brighton with no trouble, I really don't see why Aristophanes... Anyway, hardly relevant. But the Lysistrata, the women of Greece, are sick of the Peloponnesian War, which has been going on by this point for, I think, about 15 years, or maybe 20. And the men will not make peace, uh, or not successfully. And so the women surreptitiously meet, the women of Athens, of Sparta, of Corinth, and they say, right, let's have a sex strike. No sex until the men stop the war. We will not make love until they stop making war, and that's how this will go. And the men, obviously, are furious um, and can't believe it. And there are many scenes that are very, very visually very vulgar and funny. Uh, the men all walk on with massive stick on erections. Of course, the women are sex crazed because it's Aristophanes. So it pains them just as much as it pains their menfolk not to have sex. And they are, of course, in turn being played by men. So the level of gender identity <laughs> is quite blurry. Even Jermaine Greer, I think, would be there for a minute going. Yeah, give me a sec. Um, <laughs> and so, the women have their sex strike. The older women um, do not participate in the sex strike because there isn't any point. I'm sorry, it's not me, it's Aristophanes, let it go. <laughs> and so they take over the Acropolis where the Athenians keep their cash. Um, and the old men come and say, get out of the way, horrible old women, and let us have the cash. And they go, no, and pelt them with stuff until they run away. So you see, they are good at, they're good for something, and that's important. Um, and so, the sex strike is incredibly successful, and the men capitulate and war is over and they get to make love and not war and it all works out and this is a very very funny vulgar um, and I think brilliant comic fantasy 
and at no point could it actually happen, except that earlier this year in March, um, Belgium became uh, a country which had had no government, no functioning government, for longer than any other country in history, because nobody could make a coalition. And in fact, I think they still don't have a coalition government now, I may be right to say. Um, I'm part Belgian, I should know this, but I think they still don't. And their elections were last June, so I think it's now been a year. And one of their senators, a woman called Marlena Zemmerman, said, do you know what we should do? Everyone who's married to one of the negotiators should go on sex strike. And that will force them to make a decision. I went, oh, how ridiculous. Yeah, all right, but two years ago in Kenya, that's exactly what happened, and it worked. Isn't that extraordinary? In Kenya, they went, oh, we don't, and they went, okay, no sex for you until you sort it out. And a week later, less than a week, in fact. <laughs> and this, I think, is extraordinary. That The very earliest writing about politics, I mean, the Athenians have a lot of failings. They aren't, you know, just wandering around in lovely white, uh, tunics being generally brilliant and coming up with perfect art, although certainly they did come up with some pretty perfect art. But they do lots of things very badly wrong, often. And yet, they are the first people to start writing about, thinking about politics, asking questions that need to happen. And saying, well, why is it right for, you know, a king to rule? What about, you know, if a king is the good version of a single ruler, a tyrant is the bad version? Okay, well, then an aristocracy, that's a good version of a small leading elite. Aristos at the time, of course, meaning best and not whose dad is richest. Um, and then, but that can easily become an oligarchy, a uh, rule of the few who are just there because they have power and not because they have virtue. We can have a, a positive ruling of the masses, democracy, but that can easily turn to oclocracy. Anyone? Mob rule, come on! This is what happens when you do the BHA. Oh yeah. Don't bother doing any references to Doctor Who, Natalie. We're not going to get it, but give us a Greek quiz. All right. I understand, Manchester. It's all going to be fine. Mob rule, precisely. I'm having such a nice time. <laughs> the best day of my year so far. I swear to God. So they think and ask a lot of political questions. How extraordinary is it that one of their earliest um, political writers in Aristophanes, a man who constantly makes jokes, who loves to make jokes about the um, political system, who has a play, The Knights, uh, where an old man is called Deimos, the people, um, and he gets, you know, generally the wool pulled over his eyes and mistreated by the people around him. Um, and, you know, he's, he's very capable of these extended political fantasies. I hesitate to say satire, and you'll see why in a minute. Um, although you probably already know. I don't know why I'm bothering. Um, and so, uh, the very earliest kind of political discourse, the very earliest political comedy, he comes up with an idea, the sex strike, which still works two and a half thousand years later. People still go, oh, come on, let's give that a try. And then it works out. It, this just seems to me the most brilliant and extraordinary thing. Um, the reason that I don't say satire is, I feel almost, I, I feel like we should have a quiz and you should answer, but maybe not, because I have gone to the trouble of, you know, turning up. Um, <laughs> I could have just said, I could have done this down the phone. Um, the only uh, literary form that the Romans invented is satire. Everything else is Greek. History, biography, tragedy, epic, comedy, everything else is Greek. And the Romans invent one thing, satire. Um, now, does anyone know where the word satire comes from? This is a good quiz question. A goat is a good question, a satire, yeah, no, but it's a good answer and a plausible one too, because no one really knows. So the other option is a satire play, incidentally, um, is one when you get three tragedies, you get a fourth one, like the Alcestis, Euripides Alcestis, uh, where everyone does not die at the end, and that's a satire play, and usually there are more stick-on penises than that as well. I'm not going to defend their choices of uh, the actual costume, it's just the way it goes. But uh, the word satire probably comes from satura, meaning a pudding, like a mixed, like a Christmas pudding almost, with lots of different things in, so it's all just a big mishmash, and that perhaps, is where satire comes from. And the finest satirist is easily the most horrible person about women anywhere in the ancient world. And that is, of course, my beloved juvenile, who is a terrible, terrible, terrible person. He is anti-Semitic, he's racist, he's misogynistic. And he's just so funny. You have to... <laughs> You have to just let it go. He's a bad man, but he's a very, very good comic. And he wrote um, what we call satires, but actually the ancients probably called skurai. Um, a skura is a rant. So Juvenal really did turn up, like I used to for a living, and basically mouth off for 20 minutes and then bugger off having been paid. He, his job really was being a stand-up comedian. His pieces are designed to be spoken rather than read, which is why when you read them, you sometimes find yourself go, that doesn't quite follow on from this. And you realize that with the sort of oomph of performance, the logic of it would, would work perfectly well that you could easily go in a big circle and then come back and then yeah, comics do it all the time uh, they call it ring composition when it's Homer uh, they call it uh, tangent <laughs> when you're me and that seems fair enough um, and he wrote uh, one satire which is very much longer than the other satire six 
um, which is all about women. All the other satires, I think there are three, two or three to a book. Uh, satire 6 takes up a whole book on its own. And boy, does he hate women. But, and this is crucial, um, what Juvenal gives us is a sight into lower class women, of lower class people, full stop, that mostly we have writing from rich people because they're the ones who can afford the time to write. They're the, the ones who can afford to be educated, to learn to write. They're the ones who can afford scribes or to have um, versions of their work copied down. Um, and they are the ones who can afford to preserve their legacy, in essence. And so those men, and they are almost exclusively men, tend to write about women that they like. So we have endless love poetry from Catullus, Propertius, Tibullus, Ovid, um, saying, you know, this beautiful woman, oh, lesbia, uh, Catullus's other half, well, somebody else's other half, Catullus's girlfriend, um, to be quite correct, but of course she was married. Um, he says, you know, you're very beautiful, and then there's a lovely poem about a dead sparrow, which turns out to be a huge metaphor for impotence, and, you know, that kind of thing. So you get these poems about these very beautiful society women, but you don't get poetry about the, the woman who does the washing. Those don't exist, because if Cicero did have an opinion on the woman who did his laundry, he doesn't write it down, and it doesn't survive. So it, what's brilliant about Juvenal is even though he's being vile about women throughout Satire 6, um, and at least he's not specific, he will be vile about every other social category by the end of the book of Satires. That's just a fact. Um, what we get is an idea of how actual women actually lived. We know, for example, that the law says, Augustus's law says, that women of senatorial class couldn't consort with actors or gladiators without running a risk of losing their class right down to being a, an ex-slave. So they'd fall right the way through, from senatorial through the middle class, right down to you know, below a pleb. Um, and yet, uh, in juvenile, so you'd think, oh, well, no one would do that then. That's a terrible taboo crime. No one would do such a thing. In juvenile, we find out uh, why Epia would put up with being labelled the gladiatress um, because she has uh, an affair with this gladiator who's got a horrible weeping sore on his nose he's been cut open so many times and he's really disgusting and ugly and very stupid and slightly deaf because he's been hit on the head so often. But the lure, the glamour of being a gladiator, he was a gladiator, says Juvenal, what of it? Um, that is enough. So that's what's interesting about Juvenal. Juvenal gives us, we have the law, we have the rules, we have exactly what people are supposed to behave like on one side, and then we have Juvenal going, yeah, she's totally screwing the guy from the games. I don't know if anyone's mentioned it, but she's totally, yeah, no, I know. Um, it's Juvenal who goes, yeah, women totally have sex with eunuchs, so they don't have to worry about an abortion. Yeah. What? And there it is right there. There it is. You know, this isn't a revisionist where you can read it. Or you can only read it if you have quite a, a broad grasp of Latin, because juvenile is very, very difficult. Um, and when I was a student, um, this is a small and relevant anecdote, they would give you a tiny dictionary um, for sort of general use, and then a massive dictionary. The big dictionary, I may have to get my big dictionary out. I mean, I, I basically did just used to use it to, you couldn't even use it to prop up a, a table. It was sort of this thick, it was huge. Um, and when you did juvenile, then you would suddenly come across words that were so difficult that when you looked them up in your small dictionary, they just weren't there. And then you would look them up in the big dictionary, and they were so filthy that the big dictionary would just give you the Greek. <laughs> And you go, okay, luckily I'm doing both languages. Let me turn to my big Greek dictionary. And then you would look it up in the Greek dictionary and it would just give you the Latin. You go, just tell me. Just tell me where the masseur is putting his hand. It can't possibly be as bad as what I'm imagining. Just give me the damn word. But I presume they have slightly less um, uh, Victorian maiden dictionaries now, <laughs> but I suspect not. So, um, Satire 6 is full of comprehensive smuts on the subject of women, um, and, uh, and indeed on the subject of men, eunuchs, and everybody else. Um, but one of the most interesting things about Satire 6, I think, um, is Juvenal is an incredibly epigrammatic writer, and many of the phrases that we know now in Latin are from him. Arara arwis, a rare bird. That's juvenile. Um, we'll come later to uh, Satire 10. At least I'll try and remember to come later to Satire 10. Um, and uh, perhaps the most famous, perhaps the most quoted epigram, I think, in all of Latin literature um, is in Satire 6, uh, which is quis custodiet ipsos custodes. And it is always brought out now um, on the subject of things like CCTV, right? People go, oh, yeah, yeah, you can. The government can have face recognition ID at Heathrow, but who goes, the girls are like, ah, oh, quiz custodian, and you go, yeah, no, that's fair enough. I'm sure Juvenal would have disapproved of an over-intrusive government, but actually, in Satire 6, the context is that he's talking about what it's like to have a very unchaste wife. Um, and if you have a very unchaste wife, she is going to just have sex with all your friends and it will humiliate you. So what you might want to do, says Juvenal, is get bodyguards. But the thing is, if you get bodyguards, <laughs> she's just going to end up screwing them. Quiz 
custodiet, ipsos custodiet. So the next time someone is on the news going, oh, but who guards the guards themselves? On the subject of civil liberties being really po-faced, it's very important that you remember that its original use was for slutty girls that you couldn't keep in check. I find it immensely gratifying. Now, that's probably enough on women, isn't it? Because, oh, holy shit, look at that, it's half past ten already. Uh, what else was there? Um, uh, religion or um, uh, philosophy or town and country? or What was you? You were super excited. Town and country, good choice, madam, because you did their arms. That's why I came to you. Everyone else just went, this thing, meh, meh, meh. You're just a big murmuring crowd in Shakespeare when you do that. Rhubarb, rhubarb, you might as well say. She did arms. That's all I'm saying. That's all I'm saying. She did arms. That's how she wins. The one who wants it the most gets it. That's the way it goes. Did you do arms? You did not. She did. That's the rules. So, town and country, wasn't it? Yes, town and country. So, uh, juvenile is excellent excellent on the town um, but we should probably talk a little bit about the country I think first um, the countryside for the ancients is exactly I think as it is now more construct than reality so we end up with the idea of the countryside as being this beautiful rural idyll all these words of course come from Latin or Greek idyll the Greek uh, rural uh, from Rus Rus in urbe uh, from Latin so the, this idea of a perfect country um, you know that everything is so pretty it's an eclogue uh, and the octopus will have, you know, so there'll be some lovely nymphs and satyrs uh, wandering about, and the nymphs were actually, they're a little rapey when you think about it. And Rialto, not very idyllic for the nymph. Uh, they're almost always running away uh, from a satyr and trying to turn into a tree or some water uh, in order not to get attacked. Um, uh, sidebar, uh, so bad was I at Latin uh, when I was in my first year at college uh, that we were translating a bit of, I'm going to say Ovid, and this is being recorded, so I will rue the day when it turns out I'm entirely wrong, but let's assume Ovid. Um, and and she is on the knee of a satyr in this poem. Um, and uh, her name, her, the nymph's name is Echo, uh, and from indeed where we get the word echo. Um, and uh, she's on his knee, and it's not going terribly well. And my friend Rob, who was also studying Latin, said, but why doesn't echo decline? And I was so entirely not in the Latin zone that I genuinely assumed he meant say no, rather than go into the accusative. <laughs> It's a good question, isn't it? Why doesn't Echo decline? I don't know. Screw you, Satyr, I'm off. Oh, no, I see. She should. <laughs> I swear to God, there isn't another room in the country where that would have got a laugh. <laughs> it's just this one. Come on, Manchester. First here, then the world. So... The countryside is entirely a construct of, you know, beautiful things and greenness and loveliness. And yet, it is also a very, very dangerous place. So by far the most dangerous countryside place in ancient Greece is Mount Cithaeron. Um, so it's very beautiful, it's very green, it's, and yet everything that goes badly wrong in a Greek tragedy happens on Cithaeron every single time, or indeed a Greek myth it happens on Cithaeron. So uh, a good example is, of course, the story of uh, the Bacchae. Euripides Bacchae happens on Mount Cithaeron, um, where a new god comes to town. The king says, no, I don't recognise you. That's a sensible thing to do if you're king. Obviously, and he's your half-brother or uh, step-brother, I can't remember. Um, and, uh, and, and so we don't acknowledge you. And then your mother gets turned into a terrible bacchant, and so do your aunts. And eventually, they rip off your head because they think you're a baby lion. And I mean, it's, it's not a happy time, uh, the Bacchae. And that happens on Cithaeron. When things go wrong, when the, the, the countryside turns on us, essentially, it turns out that it's not beautiful and rural and ideal. What it actually is, is somewhere where we can't really understand it. The n that nature, however much we try and tame it and make it lovely and countryside-y, is actually wild. It's not as. Uh, Acteon also dies on Cithaeron, the man who, uh, some way or another, offends the goddess Diana. Does he see her bathing? Or maybe he accidentally shoots one of her stags? We don't know. But what we do know is that she turns him into a stag himself, and then he is torn apart by his own hunting hounds, again, on Cithaeron. When anything bad happens, this is the place that it goes. So it kind of seems tempting that we should think about the town, in that case, it seems a little safer. You're less likely to have your head ripped off by your mum because she thinks you're a baby lion, generally, in the town. The town doesn't have that kind of... It has other deviant behaviour, but it doesn't have that kind of deviant behaviour, mostly. Um, and now more of us in the world, for the first time ever, I think two years ago, more of us now live in cities than uh, in the countryside. Um, so we have become, we are, as uh, Aristotle knew, a politicon zoon, a political animal. Um, and by political, of course, he means somebody of the city. I think it's fair to say even Aristotle didn't approve of the countryside alliance. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> um, 
But Juvenile is at his best on the city. Um, he, however much he hates women, he hates Rome more. And this, this is why he is a brilliant comedian. Um, because it is, I think, in satire, I'm going to say three, might be one. Um, then he, he does a big, he does the big rant about why a friend of his, Juvenile's friends are almost always juvenile, if you see what I mean. I mean, they have a different name, but it's like my friend fancies you. What he means is I. I hate Rome, I hate Rome. His friend, Umbricius, is leaving Rome. I'm leaving Rome because he says, there's nothing for me here. Every year, and this I think is incredibly topical, every year I'm poorer than I was last year. In other words, inflation was high and his income was low. Um, and I can't afford anything. And there's no work for an honest man in Rome. I, I never learned how to lie, um, is what he says. Uh, now, it's worth bearing in mind that Juvenal is a massive snob. He may not be rich, but he sure does despise the idea of doing an honest day's work. So uh, many of the jobs that Juvenal considers infradig, again, a word, a phrase which I feel sure someone in this room can parse, infradignitatum, right, beneath your dignity. Oh, it's brilliant being here. Um, and so he considers infradig all kind of harbour building. Oh, harbour building. Yeah. What? <laughs> so, scummy, scummy harbour building. It's not, well, all right, yeah, I suppose, grave digging, he doesn't, approve, he doesn't approve of any job, basically. The only thing juvenile really has to be is polite, because Rome, of course, operates on a, a pyramidal system of patronage, right? So at the very top, you have the emperor, and then under him, he is the patron of some very rich senators who uh, support him and who he, in turn, financially aids. And then they support people, the next rung down, of whom there are very many more. They are for a little less money, for a little more political support. And then they support the... and so on. So all Juvenile really has to do is turn up and say, oh, aren't you marvellous at writing poetry to some rich person? And they will bunk him a cash handout. And he says, oh, I can't tell somebody their rubbish book is good. Learn! Learn, juvenile! Why are you so stupid and self-defeating? He could at least, I always think, have done that Nancy Mitford thing when she got sent a book that was abysmal and people asked her what she thought of it and she would go, darling, good is not the word. Yeah. <laughs> Even after she's dead, that must have still hurt. Do you know what I mean? Oh. So unkind. So Juvenal is very, very bad at living in the city because he knows the rules, but he despises the rules. He hates the thought that you need to be nice to somebody to get a dinner party invitation. Um, in fact, he hates the very idea of... The Romans loved dinner parties. If we think we're obsessed with come dine with me, the Romans loved a dinner party. I have two dinner party stories for you. This is the epitome, of course, of city living, is the dinner party. You ask people around, you do it at your house, and then you show it off. Firstly, we'll do Juvenal, and then we'll do Vedius Pollio, but don't let me forget Vedius Pollio, because he's really good. Um, Juvenal, so, uh, talks about this awful, awful dinner party that a friend of his gets invited to. <laughs> um, and and he com the entire dinner is an exercise in uh, affirming status, relative statuses. So he talks about the fact that you get, that your host has got this lovely white bread made from lovely milled white flour. It's interesting, right, that uh, white bread used to be a sign of being rich, if you could afford it, and then eventually, by the about 80s, it had become an insult. To be white bread meant you were white trash, meant you were poor, and now lovely mm, wholemeal, but no, not for juvenile. Um, for, but then, to be fair, the options there are lovely white bread, or bread that still has stones in it, which I guess is slightly worse than seeds. Um, so he talks about that you get this horrible teeth-breaking bread and your host is having this lovely white fluffy bread and you get this disgusting vinegary wine and your host is having this lovely delicious vintage and he describes it so this this is why juvenile is a genius even if he is morally indefensible on a frequent basis he describes the dinner in two latin words two words a perfect epigram just slamming the two together he says why would you do this or, this friend of mine why would you go to this dinner when should you can you beg under a bridge wouldn't that be better it, you know, can't you just beg for food? Wouldn't that be better than going for the inuria canam, the insult of dinner? Oh, look at that. Look at that old oxymoronic construction and just applaud. Can't you look at it? <laughs> Slam, insult, dinner, bang, straight into one fray. Oh, he's a, he's a genius. I love juvenile. You can probably tell. He's brilliant. And so he talks about this, but we shouldn't forget Verius Pollio, whose story comes to us from Seneca, everyone's favourite stoic, um, in uh, his work on anger. Um, and Vedius Pollio uh, invites the Emperor Augustus, uh, Brian Blessed, for those of us who haven't been paying attention. <laughs> <laughs> but not when he goes, Gordon's alive. That's a different Brian Blessed. That's, that's a different one. You have to get this right. You see, I live with an actor. I'm still easily confused. Really, they're not the same. They're not the same. I say, oh, OK. Um, so uh, Brian Blessed slash Augustus goes for dinner at uh, Vedius Pollio's house. And Vedius Pollio has a beautiful set of glass goblets. 
Um, and as those of us who like nice glass will know, that is a risky business, right? You, you've got to have spares, because your little heart will break if you have six and then someone breaks one. And that's exactly what happens to Vedias Polio. Uh, one of his slave boys picks up one of these jeweled goblets and he drops it and it smashes. Um, and Vedias Polio is so incensed by this that he orders the boy to be fed to a pool of man-eating lampreys. Now, if this sounds eerily familiar to you, you are thinking of Blofeld in <laughs> James Bond, who feeds hapless Helga Brandt to a pool of man-eating piranhas that he only has, well, woman-eating piranhas, technically, which he only has for the purposes of eating people. Hapless miscreants, right? They're not beautiful. Lampreys aren't beautiful. You just have them so you can go, oh, I feel a little vexed with you. I think I'll feed you to some fish. That's the only reason for it. The first Bond villain, Vedius Polio, the first century, the turn of the first century, the contemporary of Christ is Vedius Polio. Exciting, huh? Yeah, a little bit. The first Bond villain. And uh, the little boy is so traumatized that he's about to be fed alive to man eating fish that he runs to Augustus, the Emperor Augustus, Brian Blessed, um, and begs for mercy. He doesn't beg not to be killed, which I think is really interesting. He begs just not to be fed to the fish. It obviously doesn't occur to him he doesn't deserve to die. It just occurs to him that he doesn't want to be eaten alive by fish. And Augustus is so appalled by the cruelty of this that he orders that the lamprey pond be filled in with concrete, which of course the Romans invented. Um, and uh, it, we don't know what happens to the lampreys. I like to think they were taken out before, but I don't, don't know. And the boy is set free, and he orders that every one of Vedius Polio's fancy glasses is smashed while he stands there watching. Pretty cool, huh? Yeah, now I know. That's a pretty, see, see what a good story you brought out? You brought out a good story, madam, with your arms. That's what happened. Well done, you. Um, so, uh, the, a juvenile hates, hates living in a town, and the reasons that he hates living in a town are exactly the reasons that people who hate living in towns now hate living in them. He says, um, you can't afford to live anywhere because your money is going down every year, but also rents keep going up. These kind of eye-gougingly expensive rents from cheap, shoddy landlords um, uh, just keep shooting up and you can't afford it. And he points out that these buildings are incredibly unsafe. Um, he says they're all about to collapse at any moment's notice. And this is another phrase, another juvenile epigram, which just has swept through time, through 2,000 years, and we still use it now. He says, you know, you complained about the fact the building's about to fall down, and the guy texts it to Artem. He papers over the cracks. I know, no, I know. It's cool, isn't it? Yeah, no, I know. And he talks about the risks of fire. You're not supposed to cook inside these. The Romans had, um, if you were poor, you would live in an insula, perhaps, uh, which is like an apartment block. And it, it would look exactly like Manhattan in that kind of grid system. And they went up very high. This is how fire spread so quickly um, in the ancient world until the great fire of 64, uh, where the emperor Nero steps in and says that buildings have to be placed a bit further apart. And that at least at the bottoms, where people were more likely to be cooking, um, they needed to be covered with stone or marble so that it, they were less the fire was less able to jump and you would think that that would make him seem popular but Tacitus so brilliantly bitchy when he writes about this um, he says uh, that Nero he talks about the fact that Nero uses the opportunity of the great fire to build his new palace the Domus Aurea the golden house um, and uh, it's an enormous block it's what it's on that very site is where the Colosseum ends up being built uh, later on when Nero sadly died, having been uh, stabbed in the neck by his secretary, uh, in case anyone was wondering. Oh, don't you normally do my filing? <laughs> um, <laughs> that's how I like to characterise it. I'm not sure that's exactly what happened. That's not the words he dies with. He dies with the words, what an artist I die. Uh, Qualis artifex pereo. Uh, but he still gets stabbed in the neck by a man called Epaphroditi. That's all I'm saying. Um, and so, uh, where were we? Oh, yeah, the Great Fire. See, you're good at keeping me back on track, aren't you? I go off on a tangent, and then you're right there, like a little beacon going, no, town and country, Natalie, is what I asked for. You're absolutely right, madam. So, the great fire happens, Nero builds this golden house, but he comes up with all these ideas for how fire should spread less easily. Um, and when Tacitus reports this, you would expect him, I would expect him, I wouldn't, I've read him, um, to go, oh, well, thank goodness at least somebody cared about poor people not dying in a fire. Instead, he begins the chapter, I swear to God, with the phrase, in parts of Rome, unfilled by Nero's new palace. Ooh! <laughs> Meow, Tacitus! Holy moly! But there it is. Um, and so fire was a constant risk, and Juvenal presents this vile picture of being the person who lives at the very top of one of these apartment blocks. Um, the only thing protecting you from the pigeons is the roof tiles, he says. Um, and the fire begins. It's, it's one of these extraordinary, horrible cartoons that he does, like, almost like political cartooning now, where a picture starts quite innocently and then suddenly becomes vile, but using words rather than, you know, drawing. Um, so the fire begins down here, and the people on the ground floor, he says, are, they're moving all their you know, treasured belongings out of the building as the fire goes up, and you're about to die, but you don't know it. 
You have no idea. The fire shows up, nobody comes to get you, and you're the last one to find out. It's really, really terrifying. And you realize that that's an experience that people had to put up with all the time. So, Juvenile doesn't like landlords because they charge too much and they make you live somewhere shonky. And everything is a fire hazard, and that's bad, by the way. Um, the crime and noise, because of course in Rome, you couldn't use a wagon during the day. The streets were too crowded with pedestrians. And so everything, everything came through at night. Um, and you have these uh, wagons full of building materials that would come through. And he describes this, he says you'd have to, you'd be very unwise if you went out without making your will first. Um, and he describes this again, a horrendous cartoon of a man who gets, uh, he's at the side of the road and all this stuff falls on him and he's crushed to death and he says, you know, he, this, this man has just gone out, his family don't know he's missing yet and he's already on the banks of the river in the underworld waiting to cross. It's just again a, a really horrific image. Um, so everything is terrible, the noise is bad, it's dangerous, you can get mugged, a grossator is the Latin for a mugger. Um, and, uh, and, the, and again he has a, a, an incredibly complicated uh, idea to slam into a few words. This idea that you could get mugged by these men who are together, they're very rich, they're very well to do, um, and yet they are out for trouble, they're determined to pick a fight with you, and they will either beat you up or sue you for having tried to attack them. Or if you're really unlucky, they'll do both. They'll beat you up and then say you started it and, and beat you up in court a second time over. And so eventually, this is exactly what stand-ups still do now, eventually he talks himself into such a corner, he says, right, well then, no one would live in Rome, right? It's vile there. Why would you live in Rome? You, you should move to the countryside. His friend is moving to Kumai. It's beautiful in Kumai. It's the gateway to the south. It's a beautiful part of the world. Um, why wouldn't you want to go there? And his friend says, come on, move here. You can have a massive house for what you can have a tiny, tiny cramped apartment in Rome for. Exactly what people say now about moving to the country. He says, why wouldn't you? Come on, come on with me. And, and Juvenal says, yeah, and what? Be the, lord of all, be the overlord of all those lizards that will fit into and that's exactly what comedians do they set up they go this is terrible this is terrible the city for example this is terrible this is terrible and so the only option is its opposite and then that's even worse that's much worse because the city is full of awful people who don't know better so country bumpkins and so however horrendous Rome is and he spent like 500 lines telling us it's terrible god help him that he would live in the country because he would uh, I've talked for much too long so you should have questions or you can have another story if you want it's up to you Another story. Uh, let me tell you what your options are, and you can choose one. Um, you can have, oh, should we do the Josephus problem? Would that be fun? Do you want that? Oh. So, um, religion in the ancient world. I know it seems perverse to talk about it at a BHA conference, but, you know, I figure you're more interested in the average. So, uh, the Romans are famous for pretty much one thing, religiously speaking, uh, and that is that they persecuted Christians all the time and threw them to the lions. Not true, I'm afraid. The Romans hardly ever persecuted Christians. That's how come Christianity managed to thrive under Rome. Um, sometimes some emperors persecute them. Nero is a good example. Uh, and even Roman writers who don't like Christians. And largely it's political, um, rather. Than, I mean, they worship a, a criminal, right? That's seditious. So it's a political issue. And they don't sacrifice to the genius, uh, the genius of the emperor, who obviously has royal ancestors. Um, this is satirised again very well by Seneca when he writes the apocolican tosis of the Emperor Claudius uh, on death. The Emperor uh, is apotheos, turned into a god. Um, on his death, according to Seneca, uh, Claudius is apocolican toast, uh, turned into a pumpkin. Um, and a very satisfying word to say if anyone's feeling a bit sad later. Apocolican tosis, mm, happy again. Um, and so they are very, very famous for killing Christians, and yet they didn't. Uh, a Christian scholar in America, I think his name is Everett Ferguson, um, has estimated that more Christians have been killed in the last 50 years than in the first several hundred of the church, just to give you an idea of the figures involved. Jews, however, got pulverized <laughs> by the Romans on a frequent basis. But again, um, not because the Romans are intrinsically anti-Semitic, um, but because the Romans uh, found Judea to be a massive uh, political and military black spot. Um, and in the great uh, wars of Judea, in which a million, estimated by Josephus, who is, of course, and this is where these kinds of stories are so difficult, this is why it's always difficult to unpick anything about religion, um, which is why we end up thinking there are so many martyrs, so many Christian martyrs. The Romans don't care about Christians who die, because why would they? They're just criminals. They don't list every other criminal who dies, everybody who shoplifts, everybody who mugs somebody. They're not interested, so they don't record it. So the only records of people being martyred are written by Christian writers who have every interest in recording a martyrdom and no interest in recording the people who go, yeah, you're right, Jesus sounds stupid, and walking out of the room, not dead. So you end up with a very... It feels like... The, uh, those uh, catalogues of martyrdom always feel a bit you know, Monty Pythonish to me. That, that people are asked, oh yeah, will you renounce Jesus Christ and worship to the emperor? And they go, no, kill me, kill me now! And you kind of go, oh God. It's like the knight going, oh, come over here and I'll bite your kneecaps. Um, that, 
I guess that's the way it looks to uh, the uh, godless like me. Um, uh, but the Jews did get killed, and Josephus is uh, a... He's a Jewish tribal leader first, so trying to unpick the levels of his bias is really, really difficult. He is pro-Jewish, for sure. He's a Jewish tribal leader. But that means he's especially intolerant of tribal leaders from different tribes that aren't his. You, it means you're never going to get him criticizing the Romans. He can't afford to. They're the ones who stopped him from dying during the Judean Wars. He, he became friends with you know, Roman, men who went on to become Roman emperors, men who were Roman commanders, and so on, and so on. So trying to unpick Josephus' truth is difficult. So we won't try. We'll just do the Josephus problem, which still exists today. Uh, when the Romans decide that they want Josephus, he and his tribe are in a cave. They've been um, besieged in this cave. I can't remember how many people are there, 50 or something. Um, and Josephus says, well, th they're demanding that I give myself up, so I'll go and give myself up. And they go, no, we'll die first. Okie dokie, let's not try that. Um, okay, what about if, uh, well, what, what's your idea? And they go, I'll tell you what, we'll all commit suicide. And he goes, no, no, bad idea. Uh, that, no, that's a bad idea. And here's why. Because um, bringing your hand against yourself is incredibly, incredibly morally wrong. You know it's morally wrong. God won't forgive you. Committing suicide, totally unforgivable. Let's not do that. And somebody goes, oh, okay. Uh, what about if we all stand in a circle? And like I, I person A, I paraphrase slightly, um, I will kill the person two people over. Let's call him D. And then, you know, and so on and so on. We'll all go around the circle. So I'll kill him, uh, but not until he's killed him. And then he first has to kill him, and so on and so on. And then we'll keep going around and keep going around until there's one man left standing and he'll kill himself. So only one person will have to commit suicide, right? That's quite a good system. Everyone else will just have killed somebody else. And that's fair enough. Holy war, that's, that's fair enough. Only one suicide. And Joseph goes, yeah, that's a brilliant idea. I'll stand here. And they go around and go around and go around and go around. And the last man standing is Josephus. And he walks out and gives himself up to the Romans. <laughs> and he doesn't even say, ta-da, check me in my maths. Come on. He says, oh, yeah, it must have been coincidence. Or maybe it was God's hand. <laughs> maybe it was Josephus. Or maybe you're good at sums. Very, very hard to say. Very hard to say. But mathematicians and computer people still do this now, the Josephus problem, where you have to work out the number of people and the interval of people in order to be Josephus, to be the last man standing. I think that's the most brilliant thing, uh, as religious stories go, uh, turning into a science story is very exciting. So one final word uh, before... I don't, I probably don't, even know, I don't know why I'm looking behind me. I've got a watch. There isn't a clock. Mm. Um, uh, one final word on religion, uh, since we are uh, not such a religious bunch, perhaps, uh, is Protagoras, um, who, of whom I'm immensely fond. Uh, when people ask me my religious position, and I regret ever saying this on record, because I get endless mail then from somewhere in America with people going, Dear Natalie Haynes. <laughs> um, I always say I am a Protagorean agnostic. Um, and I say this because when I was, I think, 18 or 17, and doing ancient history A-level, uh, I came across this quote of Protagoras, which I'm sure you know already, uh, where he, said, he begins a book with the phrase, On the subject of the gods... I am unable to say whether they exist or not. There are many obstacles to such knowledge, including the obscurity of the subject and the brevity of human life. And I went, that's really good, I'm having that. Yep, yeah, that's what I felt. Now, Cicero tells us that his books were burned for writing that. Um, it can't, of course, be completely true, because Cicero knows the quote. So if they were burned, they weren't all burned, which is often the way when one burns books. Uh, you can't manage to get rid of all the information. Uh, but worth bearing in mind, of course, the quote at the Babelplatz in Berlin, uh, where books are burned in the end. People will burn. Um, we probably have, I think your next talk starts at 11, is that true? And it's mm, about 5 to 1 question, no questions? What do you want? Three minutes. Three questions. Three questions. Hand them over. This is pathetic, Manchester. <laughs> For people who could define ochlocracy, this is feeble. <laughs> Screw you. Yes, good. Uh, the meaning of life. Oh, I was going to come back to this with juvenile, and you've totally... Ah, oh, now this is my favourite row anywhere. <laughs> You are the best row. You've got an excellent laugh. You've asked an excellent question prompting that juvenile thing, and you kept me entirely on track in town and country. This row rules. That's all I'm saying. Well done, row. Um, I'm going to call you Row C if you're the third one back. The meaning of life is, uh, for me at least, juvenile, as usual, is the answer. Um, juvenile is the angriest man in the world all the time. He is furious that there are foreigners in Rome. They're taking his jobs. They're taking the women. They're doing this. The women are all sluts anyway, oh, apart from the ones who are boring blue stockings. And they're all know-it-alls. Furious, furious. Juvenile. And then in Satire 10, he comes 
so unexpectedly to happiness instead of misery. The whole point of Juvenal is that he compares himself unfavorably with other people. They have too much money, he doesn't have enough. They have a nicer house, he doesn't have it. He's always comparing himself in an unfavorable way and feeling miserable about it. And then suddenly in Satire 10, he says, be careful what you wish for. That's our basic translation of it. Don't wish for being beautiful, because this is what happens to beautiful people. Um, the, for example, remember that really handsome man that the Empress, uh, Claudius' third wife, Messalina, really liked? Well, he wasn't interested, but she obviously liked him because he was super handsome, and so he ended up having to sort of phony marry her and then being executed by the Emperor. That's what happens to you if you're beautiful. Don't wish for power, because then you'll be like Sejanus. He was Tiberius' second in command, um, and uh, Tiberius eventually denounces him to the Senate. Um, uh, he is killed, his body is dragged to the Tiber by a hook, his children are raped and then killed, because raping a virgin in order to make, if you kill a virgin you're committing a crime, so you rape a child first. <laughs> That's the Romans, very practical, just not nice. Um, not always nice, I should say. Um, and, uh, and so his body is dragged there, and all those statues of him, all those bronze statues of him, Juvenal says, are melted down to become tomorrow's pots and pans. That's what happens if you wish for power. So don't wish for good looks, don't wish for money, don't wish for power. And he says, if you are going to wish for something, you should just let the gods decide. And you go, hmm, okay. Um, and then he says, but if you really want to know what to wish for, and this quote is so famous that not only do we all know it now, um, but it's, uh, it's been famous throughout time. It's inscribed in Rubens' house in Antwerp. Uh, which still exists, you can go visit his museum if you wish, uh, it's lovely. Um, it's inscribed up on the walls of his courtyard. He says, be careful what you wish for, but if you've got to wish for something, you should wish for mens sana, incorpore sano, a healthy mind and a healthy body. And the line goes on, it doesn't end there, in fact. He says you should wish for um, a, a life that values longevity least of its gifts, um, which I think is a very beautiful idea, and a very um, Lucretian idea too. You should wish, essentially, to not would be so desperate to cling on to things like power, money, good looks, and indeed long life itself, that you end up behaving in a fashion which makes you miserable while you are alive. That's the meaning of life, according to Juvenal. <laughs> Uh, I have never been on Just a Minute, uh, A, because they've never asked me, although whenever I see Nicholas Parsons, he tells me they are going to ask me. Lies. He lies. But he wants... I re are you still filming this? Okay. Can you turn the sound off for a second? Okay, I can't tell you in that case um, <laughs> without being slightly mean. No, I can't. No, I can't. No, I can't. But... Um, <laughs> Well, so once, Nicholas Parsons does these shows in Edinburgh, and they're very good fun, they're like a little chat show, and you go on. And Nicholas Parsons is about 400 years old, approximately 400 years old. And he comes to, he always comes, he's very committed, and he comes to see the shows of the people he's going to have on his show. And he came to see mine, um, I can't remember which year it was, it was a uh, run or die year, so 2000, I'm going to say five. And he's like, it, even then he was like 350 years old. Um, and my techie, who is an extraordinary girl, who looks exactly like Hobbes out of Calvin and Hobbes. Her name is Alyssa. She is brilliant. She looks like a little tiger. I love her. Um, and he's, he's 350 years old at that time. And he's sleeping quite reasonably. Edinburgh venues are very hot and airless. And he's having a little snooze midway through my show. The man's 350 years old. It's like 11 o'clock at night. That is fair enough. And she's so incensed by it that she turns the sound up really loud so that when this one sound cue comes in, he jumps about a foot out of his chair. And I go, Alyssa, you nearly killed Nicholas Parsons. Don't kill Nicholas Parsons. Imagine how bad it will look if you kill Nicholas Parsons in my show. And then I went to do his show the next day and I kind of wish she had because Nicholas Parsons, 350 years old, introduced me with the words, ladies and gentlemen, an amazing woman. I saw her last night, a beautiful singing voice. Now say, so <laughs> And my mum was in the audience going, what? What is she going to do if he asks her to sing? And then luckily, we had the entire conversation as though I were a comedian. So I think he just like briefly had a moment. But I do vaguely wonder if when he says, oh, you should come and be on just a minute, what he's thinking is, for a singer, you might be all right. <laughs> I have never sung, not since school choir, so that is why. Also, I talk too fast, and it's a win, just a win, minute, you need to talk slowly, because then you have time to think without it being a hesitation. But I am at least very good at breathing through my ears, uh, as you can doubtless tell. It's one of the things that makes me surprisingly popular with boys. Last question. <laughs> Too early for smart Manchester, or just time enough? <laughs> that one at the back, yes, please. Do, do you think we ever really make progress, or is human history 
just going around the same old circles all over again. That Edmund Burke thing, that those who don't know history are condemned to repeat it. Um, yeah, do you know what? I think... I don't think we progress dramatically as human beings. I do think we progress as societies. Um, but what I, I think that probably the best person on this is Thucydides, the Athenian historian, who in the first, the introduction to his Peloponnesian War history, he says, I'm not writing this for, for a current audience. I'm writing it for the future. Because human nature being what it is, one way or another, these things will, will recur. Um, now, I, I've never quite known if that was a response to like a bad review or something. Do you know what I mean? You go, oh yeah, I'm not writing it for a current audience. Um, it's, actually, it's actually meant for the future, losers. Um, or whether he actually really meant it, but I like to think he did mean it. It seems to me that it's very easy to be defeatist and say, oh, well, whatever happens, society never changes, so let's not even try. But actually, societies do change. You know, the Romans had an incredible brutality when it comes to uh, an attitude to human life, for example. I, I understand that slavery still exists. I understand that there are still more men in the world than women, for example. The Romans ha would have had, if you had a big household of slaves, um, you'd probably have been about 60% male because they let so many girls die because they weren't worth keeping. Um, and you go, okay, well, at least move from that. No, uh, for every 100 women in Pakistan, there are 111 men, um, 107 in China to 100. So, no, we haven't progressed as much as we should, but by having information at least, we give ourselves the chance to do better. The Romans knew, in the case of uh, Scribonius Libo, for example, that torture didn't work. Um, quite aside from the moral issue, they have no moral issue with torture. Torturing is fine. But they knew that they wouldn't get to the truth by doing it. Um, if, you are, if you have a slave and it's a, uh, because you have the power of life and death over them, then no one's allowed to torture them in a capital case where someone's life's on the line because you might just kill them and then they wouldn't tell the truth or maim them or whatever. So th the Romans have a rule that when it's a capital case, you can't torture because they know they won't get the truth. Um, and it seems to me that we could have done with remembering that uh, over the last decade or so, quite aside from the moral issue of torture, which to me at least is unarguable, but to many people isn't. Um, the fact that it doesn't work is something that people knew 2,000 years ago. How could we be so stupid as to think we'll get to the truth by doing it now? So that's why we should make an effort. We don't improve as human beings, but we sure do improve as groups of human beings. Is that the end? That's the end. Thank, Thank you, you very, very much, much for having me. I had a lovely time. Thank you.